everyone's done a lot of great work on non-convex optimization and tensor methods. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about some uh, recent works on proof of learning of noisy OR networks. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Sanjeev, uh, Tang Yu, uh, and uh, Andre. Uh, uh, so this is based on two recent works. One has the same title and will appear in stock, and the other is uh, still in submission. Uh, so before I tell you what are noisy OR networks, uh, uh, let me first explain why are we interested in learning noisy, uh, in learning these networks. So uh, one idea on learning uh, representation, uh, one fairly traditional idea is to use uh, latent variable models. So in latent variable models, I will assume that my data come from some model with unknown parameters. And if I manage to estimate these unknown parameters, uh, they will tell me about the structure in my data. For example, in mixture of Gaussians, I want to learn what are the means and covariance for these Gaussians. For topic models, I want to learn for each topic uh, what words uh, do we use for these topics. So it turns out for many of these uh, simple latent variable models, we can learn that using uh, a technique called ten tensor decomposition. Uh, hereby, we can learn what I mean is if you want to estimate the parameters with accuracy epsilon, you can do that uh, with polynomial in uh, problem parameter and one over epsilon, that many samples, and uh, running time is also the same polynomial. Uh, so, so we can learn these simple models, but what happens when we try to generalize uh, these results to slightly more complicated models, like the noisy OR networks that I'm going to define uh, very soon. So these more complicated models are more similar to uh, uh, more uh, nonlinear uh, versions uh, of uh, the traditional models. In particular, it is, a, uh, it is very similar to restricted Boltzmann machines. So hopefully understanding these models will tell us a bit more about why uh, deep representations are very useful. Uh, but unfortunately, the same kind of techniques does not apply immediately. Uh, these problems turns out to be harder to learn, and there are uh, much fewer uh, algorithms with the same kind of guarantees. So. Uh, one separation here is for all of these uh, previous models that we know how to learn using tensor decompositions, uh, these turn out to be linear models. And for these models that we do not know how to learn uh, before, uh, they are actually nonlinear. I will make this linear versus nonlinear more precise uh, later in my talk. So uh, in this talk, we will try to see what are some ideas we can use in order to learn these nonlinear uh, latent variable models. So, so what is a noisy OR network? Well, the typical application, is, uh, the intended application is for a disease symptom network. So this is a simple base net. Uh, it's a simple base net because uh, the graph in the base net is just a bipartite graph. On one side of the graph, we have uh, M symptom, uh, M diseases. Uh, so these diseases will uh, be 0, 1 variables, and they will be one with some fixed probability. And then uh, on the other side of the bipartite graph, we have uh, N symptoms. And we have an edge between the disease and the symptom if uh, this disease have some probability of causing this symptom. So uh, when a patient goes into the hospital, of course, what we can observe are these symptoms. We do not directly observe the diseases. So the goal of this network uh, is that if we observe the symptoms of many patients, we would want to learn how many diseases are there. And for each of the disease, what are the subset of symptoms that this uh, disease might cause? Uh, so more precisely, there are M diseases. Uh, each disease will be one with probability rho, and they are all independent. Uh, and uh, in this uh, bipartite graph, we will have edges. An edge means the disease might cause a symptom. 
and the probability, uh, the probability that the disease causes the symptom is related to the edge weight. And here we will uh, use this particular parameterization, which is uh, standard in the literature. Uh, it says if, you're, if the patient has only one disease, uh, the probability that this symptom does not happen is equal to e to the minus of the weight. So this is, uh, the weight is always a positive uh, number, so this is always something between zero and one. And uh, in the 1990s, people have uh, tried to construct these uh, disease symptom networks uh, from expert uh, knowledge. So one very famous data set, uh, or one very famous network that people have constructed is called the QMRDT network. It has uh, 570 diseases, uh, roughly 4,000 symptoms, and roughly 45,000 edges. So uh, I haven't explained uh, when a patient has more than one disease, what happens, uh, what, what symptoms should we observe. And that is also why this, uh, this model is often called the noisy or model. So let me explain now. So suppose uh, uh, the patient has these two diseases, disease one and two, and maybe both of these diseases have 50% probability of causing this particular symptom. Remember, this probability is somehow related to the edge weight. Uh, so in this case, uh, a priori, of course, there could be uh, different probabilities of uh, this patient having the symptom. But in the noisy or network, uh, the model says uh, the each disease will try to cause this symptom independently. So disease one will cause this symptom with probability 50%, and disease two will cause the same symptom with probability 50%. And we will observe this symptom if at least one of the diseases have caused the symptom. Uh, and of course, then it's easy to compute that uh, the probability that we observe the symptom is just 75%. And this is called noisy or because the noisy part refers to each uh, disease causing these symptoms uh, randomly. And the or part means once we uh, have the diseases caused by all, the, uh, oh, sorry, once we have the symptoms caused by all the diseases, uh, the final observation is a union or an or of all of these symptoms. Uh, we can, of course, uh, formalize this uh, even when you have, uh, when, even when the patient has more than two uh, diseases, and we can write uh, the conditional probability of not having a symptom fairly succinctly as a product of these exponential functions. So, uh, for these models, what we can do is. Uh, we, uh, in the first work, we give a polynomial time algorithm that can recover this W, the, weight, uh, the edge weights between diseases and symptoms uh, with uh, relative error row times square root M in L2 error in each column. Remember, each, uh, we, we formalize this matrix W in the sense that each column corresponds to a disease. So what th this is saying is for each disease, uh, we can uh, fairly accurately recover all the symptoms that it uh, will cause. And in order to interpret this, uh, let's first recall that rho is the probability that uh, the patient have one particular disease. So we should expect rho to be something small. We, we usually expect rho to be a constant over m. If rho is anything larger than that, then the patient has more a super constant number of diseases, and that's very unfortunate. Uh, so, so we always think rho is a constant over m. And in this case, uh, relative error is just one over square root m. So it, it, it is fairly small. And also in this uh, first result, we don't have any requirement on the structure of the disease symptom network. It doesn't have to be very sparse or have some special properties. Uh, the problem with the first uh, result is that uh, it is a polynomial time, but the polynomial is fairly large. Uh, so in the next uh, result, we show that if the network has some additional nice property, if it has some nice combinatorial structure, which is true for the QMRDT network, then we give a new algorithm that can recover this weight matrix with accuracy epsilon in polynomial number of samples and running time. 
uh, the structure, the combinatorial structure that we use is very similar to uh, previous works by uh, Uni Halperin and David Sontag, uh, but our algorithm is much faster and can run on, for example, <laughs> synthetic examples for the QMR DT network. Um, so on these synthetic data, we can recover uh, roughly 300 diseases out of the 570. Um, okay, so throughout this talk, I will try to uh, make a comparison between topic models and noisy OR. Uh, so a lot of our algorithms are inspired by the algorithms from topic models. Uh, so I will expl explain uh, what are those algorithms and what do we need to do in order to uh, apply similar algorithms to the noisy OR model. So let's first uh, quickly recap that a in a topic model, uh, we want to learn the topics from a lot of documents. So uh, a topic is just a distribution over words. Similarly, in the noisy OR model, a disease is like a topic, and a symptom is like a word. And here, a disease is just defined to be a set of symptoms. Um, and of course, in topic models, we allow a document to have multiple topics. And in that case, the words in this document will just come from a mixture distribution. Uh, in the noisy OR model, we also allow a patient to have multiple diseases. In that case, the symptoms are from the union of symptoms. Uh, the goal of topic model is given a lot of documents, we want to automatically find all of these topics. And the goal of noisy OR network is uh, if we observe the symptoms of a lot of patients, we would like to find out this graph structure. We want to find uh, for each disease what symptoms will this disease cause. Uh, so for topic models, there are many algorithms with fruitful guarantees. But unfortunately for noisy OR, uh, there are much fewer algorithms. So why are topic models much easier to learn in this sense? Uh, as I uh, mentioned in the first slide, uh, that's likely to be because topic models are linear, but noisy OR is not linear. Uh, let me make that more precise. And uh, for simplicity, let's look at a, a case when the document just, have, uh, just has two topics, which corresponds to a patient with two diseases in the noisy OR network. So in this case, for topic model, if you want to generate the words from this document, what happens is maybe you sample some fraction of the words from topic one. You will sample some other fraction of words from topic two, right? And uh, similarly, in the noisy OR network, you will generate uh, symptoms uh, independently from disease one and disease two. So up to here, everything still looks very similar. But uh, what's different is, it's a, in the topic modeling case, the final document is just a collection of all of these words generating, generated from both of these topics. Um, so if a word can be generated from both topic one and topic two, it will just appear more often. Uh, but for the disease uh, symptom network, the final symptom is a union of the two sets. So uh, say if I have two diseases that both will cause, say, headache, then my symptom is still just headache. I, I cannot say quantitatively that I feel twice as pain as uh, I, I had. So, so, this, um, so for the disease symptom network, the final symptom is just the union, and it is a nonlinear operation. Mathematically, what this means is if we take the expectation of this document, is going to be a linear combination of the topics. On the other hand, if we take the expectation of the symptom of a patient, then it is going to be a nonlinear expression. Uh, were there some question? Uh, oh, uh, question? Uh, for the topic model, after learning uh, the topic model, uh, you, you don't know the name of the topics. So after learn the noisy model, do you know the, the name of the disease? Oh, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, it's again similar to topic models. Uh, once you learn the diseases, you also don't know the name of the disease. Uh, it, Why is it useful? You know, here is a disease, but you don't know the name of the disease. Uh, 
Well, I, I guess uh, the name of the disease is just a word, right? What we really want to know is how to treat this disease and how to, uh, like, what to do if you, diagnose, uh, if you know the patient has this disease. And that can be formalized as a uh, downstream learning application. And presumably, if you are able to learn this model, that's going to be useful. If there's no name, you can call it wrong species. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you would ask an expert. What, what right. Uh, of course. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you might discover new disease. Yeah. If you discover something that people already know, uh, hopefully an expert will tell you. And if you discover new things, then it requires a new name, anyways. <laughs> uh, more questions? Your real data set, how often is it the case that patients have multiple diseases? And if, it, if they do have multiple diseases, that they actually have the same symptoms? The reason I ask is if usually patients have one, or if they have multiple that they're fairly different, then isn't this approximately linear and not exactly? Uh, oh, right. So, so it's a so prior uh, of uh, this QMRDT data set, the probability of the disease is actually not that low. So uh, the patient usually have uh, a, uh, not just one disease, but a, a few diseases. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, including things like high blood pressure as a disease. Uh, yeah, so, so, so one patient will have five, not one. Right. So yeah, so these are not like really <laughs> major diseases, like <laughs> if you have for those, of course, if you have, uh, if a patient have five, that's very bad. But uh, these things are. Uh, and the data set is people who end up in the hospital. So usually they discover. Wouldn't high blood pressure be a symptom and not a disease? <laughs> <laughs> There's a. Uh, what the, I mean, the the whole uh, the the whole data set is uh, like anonymized. Like it doesn't have the names of diseases and symptoms. So we don't really know. What are these diseases and symptoms? But, but there was a literature which said that actually uh, there are five or four or five diseases per patient. Oh, yes. Uh, so, so that number we do know. Yes. Uh, question? So let's say you have five distinct diseases, nameless diseases, in your training data. How would you discover new diseases? Would you, would you just add extra nodes to your network and hope that you discover new diseases? Uh, well, uh, we'll see. Uh, so so, uh, so it, again, it is similar to uh, the topic model, in topic model, in, in practice, how do you know how many topics are there? That's also not very clear. But in theory, the number of topics is going to be similar to the rank of a particular matrix. And here, you, as you will soon see, something very similar is going to happen. And of course, we can always try to first find the most significant diseases and then try to find other ones. Okay. You can think of it as causes. It, it, it's, it's basically a causal model. You want to know what is the number of causes and what are the symptoms. Yes. Causes rather than diseases. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, that's right. It has a, this model has a whole history. Yeah. Exactly. Causal. Yeah. So. So. So how do we learn these uh, nonlinear models? Well, uh, a natural idea is, since I know how to learn these linear models, maybe in order to learn these nonlinear models, we will just try to find a way to linearize the model. So how do I linearize the model? Well, uh, uh, so one way you can do is to use the pointwise mutual information. Uh, and pointwise mutual information is a measure uh, on the correlation between random variables. Here we define a PMI matrix. The IJ's entry will be just the pointwise mutual information between not having disease I and not having disease J. Uh, PMI for X and Y is just defined to be the log of the ratio between the probability that both of them happens divided by the probability that uh, they, uh, each of them happen individually. So uh, int uh, intuitively, if the PMI between two uh, random variables is larger than zero, it means these two variables are positively correlated. And if it's smaller than zero, then these two variables are negatively correlated. <laughs> and it's zero if they are not correlated at all. Um, using this idea, uh, it's easy to see that if two symptoms, I and J, share a disease, so there is a disease that will cause that has probability to cause both of these symptoms, 
then they should be co positively correlated. And in that case, the PMI will be larger than zero. If these two, uh, if symptoms I and J just do not share any disease, then according to this uh, model, uh, these two symptoms are completely independent and PMI will be equal to zero. So intuitively, this PMI will give you some intuition about the, the graph structure. And it turns out you can actually compute this PMI matrix according to the parameters. Uh, the final result is, uh, looks like uh, here a, uh, uh, a low rank matrix, rho times uh, some of these rank one components, plus higher order terms uh, that might be high rank, but they are much smaller compared to the first term. So PMI matrix is approximately this uh, low rank matrix. Uh, the rank of this PMI matrix is roughly the number of diseases in this network. Uh, and it's also very easy to prove this claim. The idea is you will just use Taylor's expansion on the log, log of one plus x is roughly x, so that's how, how you get that. Um, and uh, these higher order terms, of course, corresponds to the higher order terms in the Taylor expansion. Uh, so intuitively, what this is saying is if we apply the log transformation, it linearizes the product. Uh, remember, the, the, condition, the, products here, uh, the probabilities here are written as a product uh, of the probabilities. Um, so, oh, oh, right. Uh, so the question was, what is F? F is, uh, what is, uh, right, M is the number of uh, diseases. And F is a matrix that's closely related to the edge weights that we are trying to learn. Um, so we, uh, we will also gener uh, generalize this idea to compute three-wise uh, correlations between the symptoms. So, and once we compute the three-wise correlation between the symptoms, we will be able to find a PMI tensor. So the three-wise uh, PMI for symptoms I, J, and K is again of a similar expression, is again the log of some ratio of uh, probabilities. Uh, I will not really <laughs> explain how to get this, but intuitively, if we compute this value for all three uh, tuples of uh, symptoms, we will get a n by n by n tensor, where n is the number of symptoms. Uh, this tensor will measure the three-wise correlation between the symptoms. And uh, the reason this formula looks like this is that, that it is very uh, similar to the inclusion-exclusion formula. Uh, using the same uh, idea, we can prove a very similar claim for the PMI tensor. And it turns out that the PMI tensor is, very, again, very close to a uh, low-rank tensor. It is the sum of these uh, rank one components. Uh, it, so for the PMI tensor, we also have the similar higher order terms as we had for the PMI matrix. So there are some terms that are rho squared times other things. <coughs> and we will call these higher order terms systematic error because these are things that happens because the linearization is not perfect these systematic error terms will not go to zero even if you take infinite many samples. Okay, so now uh, let's recall how uh, were we able to learn uh, topic models using tensor decomposition. So the idea there is if you can compute the word-word correlation matrix, it turns out that will be a low rank matrix. You can then also compute the word-word-word, the three-wise correlation tensor and you can show that, again, is a low rank tensor. Using these two pieces of information, uh, we can apply uh, a tensor decomposition algorithm, and that will give us the topic matrix. So we will try to use the same approach for learning noisy OR network. So uh, how do we do that? Well, we, uh, the hope is we have the PMI matrix, which is approximately low rank, uh, like this. We have the PMI tensor, which is, again, approximately low rank. So if we apply tensor decomposition, we should recover these component fk, and fk is directly related to the parameters we want to learn. But uh, the challenge here is we actually do not have these exact PMI matrix, and 
uh, where this exact low rank matrix and this exact low rank tensor, uh, our tensor has this systematic error term that do not go to zero even if you take infinite number of samples. So we, uh, the real problem is we need to um, have a way to handle systematic error carefully. Uh, for simplicity in this talk, I will only talk about how to ha do that for the PMI matrix. Uh, so let's first look at what are these higher order terms. Turns out the higher order term also looks like uh, a low rank matrix. It will, the second order term is like rho square times GG transpose, where G is a matrix that's actually very similar to F. Okay, so, so now, from this PMI matrix, usually what we want to get is to find the column span of this matrix F. Uh, how do we do that? Well, this is a fairly typical uh, matrix perturbation scenario, right? We have this PMI matrix, which we think is similar to rho FF transpose. We have some noise terms. So I just want to say, even after adding these noise terms, the span of the top singular vectors of the PMI matrix is still close to the span of the columns of F. And there are, of course, many uh, standard matrix perturbation theorems like uh, davis kahan or Wedding theorem. But uh, unfortunately, these theorems are not strong enough. Um, in our uh, model, they will actually uh, give you a recovery error of rho times m. And remember, uh, this is not a very interesting bound because rho was like five times m, and rho m is even larger than one. So the result is uh, very uh, is not accurate. The main problem here is actually because both of these two matrices, F and G, uh, they are not very well conditioned. The condition number for these two matrices are bad. <laughs> and if you take the largest singular value of G and divide by the smallest singular value of F, that's going to be very problematic. Okay, so how do we fix this? Well, the key observation here is F and G are not two arbitrary matrices. G is not a arbitrary perturbation. G is actually very similar to F. Uh, here, especially if you assume W, uh, if, if you think W is somewhat small, then G is like two times F. Of course, W is not that small, but the same intuition applies. So intuition is, uh, I have this matrix F, it has different singular directions. Maybe it is more uh, robust or more tolerant to perturbation on the large singular directions. Uh, what do I mean by that? So here are the two cases. Uh, so the, uh, the blue ellipsoid, that correspond to the singular directions of F. The yellow corresponds to the singular directions of G. And in these two cases, in the first case, the largest singular value of G is aligned with the smallest singular value of F. And in this case, the singular directions of G is more aligned with the singular directions of F, right? So one would expect that in this case, we should have a larger perturbation because uh, G tried to perturb the small direction, which is less robust. And in this case, we should have much smaller perturbation. But existing uh, theorems, uh, like the ones I mentioned before, they will not differentiate between these two cases because what they care about is just what is the spectral norm of G, which is just this axis. Uh, and what is the smaller singular value of F, which is just this axis. So traditional theorems will not work here, and we need a new uh, matrix perturbation lemma. Uh, so what we are able to prove is that uh, the recovery error, uh, the matrix perturbation uh, is bounded by rho times this ratio here, which we define to be tau. So what is this ratio? Well, it turns out if you forget about FF transpose here, then the denominator is just the sigma min of FF transpose. So that recovers uh, the previous bounds, but now we are adding FF transpose. What that allows us to do is to say, in the directions where F is large, we can allow G to also be large. Uh, it turns out this will significantly reduce uh, this parameter tau. For QMRDT, this tau is smaller than six, uh, as opposed to uh, a few hundred uh, for the previous case. 
And under some probabilistic assumptions on the disease uh, symptom network, we can show this is probably a small constant uh, independent of the dimension of the model. So using this idea, uh, we can show that even if you just look at the PMI matrix, uh, it suffices to get a good approximation for the span of F. Uh, this is not done yet because we need to generalize this idea to asymmetric matrices and even to tensors, uh, but uh, this is done in paper, but I will not talk about it for this talk. Okay, just a very quick summary. We, in the first part, the idea is we can use uh, nonlinear transformations like PMI to approximately linearize this kind of a log linear model. And then uh, this will introduce some systematic bias, but we can use better matrix or tensor perturbation results to handle these systematic errors. Uh, the challenge here is in order to estimate the PMI tensor, you actually need a lot of samples. And, and it's more than what we can even simulate, let alone what, um, real data will have. So in the next part, I will just briefly talk about how to use structure of the disease symptom graph to get a faster algorithm. So this faster algorithm is again inspired by some works of topic models. Uh, so this is based on the idea of anchor words. So again, so we compare uh, topic models and uh, noisy or networks uh, in this matrix. The rows correspond to words or symptoms. The columns corresponds to uh, topics or diseases. And we will say a uh, symptom is an anchor symptom if it appears in only one disease. So this symptom is specific to one disease. It will not be caused by any other disease. Uh, similarly, of course, an anchor word is just a word that appear in only one topic. Uh, as an example, the second row here uh, corresponds to a anchor symptom or a anchor word because it has only one non-zero entry. Uh, the last row here is not an anchor symptom or anchor word because it has two non-zero entries. So for topic models, we know there are, there are very efficient algorithms that can learn the topic models if all the topics have anchor words. So it's natural to think maybe we can use the same idea to learn the uh, noisy or networks because we also have the PMI matrix, which is a linearized version. Unfortunately, uh, for QMRDT, not all diseases have anchor uh, symptoms. So uh, th applying this algorithm immediately will not work for QMRDT. So what can we hope for? Uh, so the, the, net, uh, the graph structure might look like this, and you can see here are two anchor symptoms, and there are two corresponding diseases. And there are these diseases that do not have any anchor symptoms. So the idea is, okay, maybe these uh, uh, diseases already have anchor symptoms. Maybe we can learn them first, and then we can remove them. It, what happens if we do that? Well, if we remove those two diseases, these two symptoms, which were not anchor before, now they become anchor symptoms. And now all the remaining diseases actually have uh, anchor symptoms. So, uh, of course, uh, this is just a very simple example. In general, we can repeat this procedure t times and think of t as a, a small constant. Uh, t is close to seven suffices for the QMR DT data set. Uh, t equals to seven actually suffices for something stronger that I define here. Uh, so it actually, we do not only guarantee that each disease have one anchor symptom, we actually guarantee that in this recursive procedure, each disease will have at least two anchor symptoms. Uh, so this is also the same assumption that's made by previous work. Uh, the previous works, uh, the first work require, uh, gives an algorithm to learn the model uh, if the graph structure is known. If I know where there's an edge and where there's no edge, in the second work, uh, this is relaxed, but the graph needs to satisfy a different condition called quartet learnable. Uh, our result uh, gives a faster algorithm compared to these two uh, works. But uh, unfortunately for all these three works, the sample complexity depend uh, exponentially on T. Uh, so the only thing we can hope for is maybe you can learn the diseases in the first few layers. 
uh, unless you have very large number of, uh, of uh, patients, uh, it will be hard to learn uh, a large number of uh, layers. So, so uh, what's our algorithm? We actually reduce the noisy OR problem to a symmetric non-active matrix factorization problem. Recall the PMI matrix is close to the slow rank matrix, uh, rho times FF transpose. And F is a non-negative matrix because its entries are one minus E to the minus W of K, and W is a non-negative uh, matrix itself. So all the entries in F are between zero and one, and this is a symmetric non-negative matrix factorization problem. Similar to before, we need to worry about the higher order terms, but uh, in this talk, I'm going to ignore that and say we focus on the exact non-active matrix factorization problem. Uh, so how do we do that uh, under the sequential two anchor condition? Well, the condition kind of, uh, question, uh, uh, yes. So the condition kind of uh, tells you uh, what kind of algorithms you want, right? Uh, the, the condition says you can repeatedly find these anchor words and remove the, the disease, uh, diseases and you will find more anchor symptoms. So in each step, we will just try to find all the anchor symptoms. We will try to learn the diseases, which are at least two anchors, and then we will remove these diseases from the graph and from the PMI matrix. Uh, so, uh, so let's look at the detailed steps of this algorithm. So the first problem is how do we find the anchor symptoms? Uh, so the idea is fairly simple. It's based on two observations. The first observation is if I have these two anchor symptoms that corresponds to the same disease, then just by matrix multiplication, the corresponding row here, the, the two corresponding rows here are both uh, just a constant multiplied with this row here. So these two rows are actually equal up to a uh, multiplicative factor. So in this case, uh, these rows are duplicates. So if you can find duplicates, they are very likely to be anchors for the same disease. Question? Would it be possible if in some iteration, like when you said T is like around seven, right? Yes. In some iteration, like you actually don't have any uh, right, so the question is whether in some iteration you will not be able to find uh, anchor words. Uh, for the QMRDT, we have the ground truth graph, so we, uh, we indeed check that uh, seven layers is enough and you never uh, run out of anchors. But of course, in general, it is definitely possible that the algorithm might fail at certain stage. Um, so the second observation here is that uh, is based on the fact that this is a symmetric matrix uh, factorization. So if I know these four entries are non-negative, then that means these four entries are also non-negative. So I can, uh, so which means all of these uh, square, uh, uh, green squares should belong to my component, that it should belong to this vector, alter product with this vector. So I can just try to subtract that, and if I find anything that became negative, that means uh, what I had before was not correct. Uh, so it turns out if you just use these two observations, uh, it suffices to uh, correctly identify all the anchor words for the QMRDT graph. And the uh, uh, second observation very crucially uses the symmetric and non-active uh, nature of the problem. So once we identify these anchor symptoms, uh, finding the disease is much simpler because we already know that this disease is just a multiple of this row here, and we only need to know the <laughs> coefficient. In order to uh, find the coefficient, we can just look at the IJ's entry, and it is equal to row times the two entries here. So if you substitute this in, the right-hand side will be a function of lambda, and we can just solve for lambda. So we can find the scaling just by observing this entry here. Um, and once you find the scaling, of course, we can just uh, remove disease P by subtracting uh, the, this column alter product with itself from the PMI matrix. 
so this is roughly how the algorithm works. Uh, we have done some synthetic experiments, uh, so we do not have real patient data. So wh what we do here is we use the ground truth uh, data set to generate uh, a large number of samples and try to run the algorithm. Uh, there are this uh, top line is the total number of diseases, and uh, the blue line is what happens if we compute the infinite uh, data uh, limit. And in that case, indeed, the algorithm will be able to find all the diseases. But in practice, uh, even if you have uh, 100 million samples, the algorithm can only find the uh, the algorithm is very robust in the first layer uh, with a relative error 0.01. But even for the second layer, it, can, uh, it already is a little bit worse than the infinite sample regime. And the third layer completely fails because the noise uh, multiply, uh, multiply uh, in each layer. So there are still many open problems here. So of course, uh, even the better algorithm we have is still not very practical, especially in terms of sample complexity. So we would want to improve that. Uh, also, we would want to understand why does the QMRDT network have this uh, sequential anchor condition? Uh, is there a good generative model for these kind of networks? And finally, uh, our ultimate goal is by uh, looking at these nonlinear models, we hope to learn more nonlinear models, such as restricted Boltzmann machines or deep belief networks. Uh, thanks.